Hi everyone, this is Jim. Uh, last weekend I played in the Western States Open in Reno, a pretty nice tournament. It was um, around 150 players there all together. There were five sections, the Open, A, B, C, and D. My section, the A section, had uh, 33 players, so pretty good competition. And, uh, well, significant prize money as well. Uh, in the Open section there were some grandmasters there, so it's kind of fun to uh, walk around the uh, playing hall and, and check check out their games. There was uh, Alex Linderman, there was Alexander Ivanov, uh, Sergei Kudrin, who's a former U.S. champion, and uh, Melikset Kachian, a great player from Southern California. So um, anyway, interesting and fun event. Let's uh, get right to the game, though. In the first round, I was uh, facing off against a player rated uh, 1955, and my rating, uh, pre-tournament rating, was 1833. Although that's not quite correct, because... Um, there's one tournament that I've played in that uh, hasn't been rated yet where I lost about <laughs> 40 points. I had a terrible tournament. So, so my real rating uh, when, when things get ordered correctly is, is around 1790, 1794, I think. It depends. And, um, but for the purpose of the tournament, for the um, pairings and all that, it's uh, 1833. And that's, that's what it says when people are looking it up in the tournament uh, to see who they're playing against and what their rating is. So my opponent here, 1955, he has the uh, the white pieces and he starts off with knight of three, go knight of six. So this knight of three can lead to all kinds of uh, uh, openings. Um, could just be a way of getting into a, a, a queen's pawn opening. He would follow up with d4. It could be a way to get into the English if he follows up with c4. Um, but he follows up with g3. So he's going for the reti opening. And I play the main response here, uh, d5. I really do not know uh, much about how to play against the ready. I just started recently playing the ready myself with the white pieces, and it is a very flexible way to play and kind of interesting, but I still don't have a, a real strong idea of what's going on here. So anyway, he plays bishop g2, and I decide to go for a fianchetto setup. I could also, I think, go for a slav type setup with c6, but um, I, I thought the, the fianchetto was a little more interesting. So I go g6, he castled, I go bishop g7, and he goes c4. Typical idea in the ready, just trying to uh, undermine this uh, light square diagonal and strengthen, strengthen that bishop. Um, but the pawn is defended, so I just castle here and let him take. Um, so in a way, this helps white a little bit. But uh, it's, it's a pretty typical way to play. Um, the reason that helps White, I, I, I was saying, thinking, is that, um, is that he gives up a C pawn, but he gets a D pawn. So he's still got two center pawns, and I only have one. But um, it's, not that, uh, it's, it's not really a problem. I have active pieces and a good bishop here, so um, I should be fine. He goes knight to C3, and, and this next move is my uh, first maybe little misstep. Um, it's not a big deal. I, I play c6 here, and uh, it's an okay move. It's still a playable position, but it's just not the most accurate move. Actually, the main move here should be uh, is c5. Just push that pawn all the way forward. I was thinking with c6, you know, I want to try and blunt the effect of that bishop here. Um, but another way to look at this position is to think of this as a Grunfeld. Um, it's a Grunfeld where white hasn't played d4, but... Uh, it, it's a very common idea in the Grinfeld defense to put this pawn up on c5 to challenge the center. And here I'm just doing it kind of in advance of d4. And um, so I'm getting a, a position which is uh, very like a, a Grinfeld where white has played the Fianchetto variation against the Grinfeld, which is uh, fine for black. So um, that should be okay. In fact, the, the chess engine gives the main line as uh, d4 here, uh, followed by Knight takes c3, another typical idea in the Grinfeld, although normally you wait you wait for e4 to before uh, taking, but just go ahead voluntarily taking and then developing. And you have a, a typical Grinfeld kind of position here with the bishop uh, on this diagonal and the knight and the pawn um, undermining the center. And, um, and uh, let's see, and like I said, white is playing a fianchetto version of the Grinfeld where um, I guess e4 is not necessarily... Uh, a, a main move at this point because it, it would block in the bishop. Although maybe maybe there's an idea here to play e4 and then e5 and try and shut down my bishop. Um, 
but that takes a couple of moves. Anyway, uh, playable position. Um, I guess what I was afraid of after c5 is he might just take. And, um, you know, if he takes my knight, I take back with the queen. The queen is kind of sitting here. Uh, it's, it's a target. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure where it's going other than just straight back. So it seemed like it might be wasting a little bit of time and his bishop might get uh, strong on this diagonal. But actually the chess engine says that black is fine here. It gives a line like this, say d3, um, knight c6. I mean, the d3 is so that the, uh, the uh, bishop can develop. And then say bishop here, putting some pressure on the pawn and bishop to d7. So I have kind of solved my problem on the long diagonal for the most part with the bishop defending the knight here. My queen still feels pretty exposed, so I don't know if I would have thought to play like this. I mean, it's kind of funny that, you know, the bishop and the knight are blocking the retreat squares of the queen, but I guess the queen has adequate space out here uh, in the open, at least uh, at first glance. And notice also the, um, the b-pawn is hanging, so that could be grabbed at some point, potentially. Um, so anyway, it seems like an okay position for black as well. So that, that would be the way to play in this position. Just go with uh, c5. I went with c6, and my opponent did go with d4. So we do get a, a kind of uh, a Grinfeld reversed, although now, no, not reversed, a Grinfeld where I've played the slow move uh, c6. Um, let's see. So I went knight d7. Seems like that's okay, although the chess engine prefers uh, knight to b6, an interesting idea just kind of clearing out the space in front of his pawn here. And um, it also restrains that pawn from moving forward by having uh, the queen and the knight both looking at that square. But just uh, getting out of the way of, uh, I suppose it's also getting out of the way of e4, which would kick the knight at some point. Anyway, knight d7 seems to be okay as well. And then he went queen b3. And at this point, um, we're no longer in the opening book. All these moves have been played before, and um, the move that was in the book uh, at this point was uh, e4, and uh, that would have gone something like this. Uh, knight takes, pawn takes, and then e5. And um, yeah, I'd actually thought of this. Uh, I was thinking that was a possible line, and uh, and I'd even thought of this e5 move. So I, I was, uh, I think I was, I was firing pretty well in terms of my uh, chess chess thinking here. Um, you need to, if we back up and think about this position, it's clear now that we're in a Grinfeld. And the typical move in the Grinfeld is to play the pawn forward to uh, c5 uh, to undermine that center. But I've already wasted a move with pawn to c6. So I was already thinking at this point it, was, it would be logical to push the e pawn forward instead of the c pawn forward. You know, take advantage of the fact this pawn is on c6, which will kind of discourage him from pushing that pawn forward and just create a position with some tension in the center. And I think uh, this should be okay for me. And um, uh, yeah, my opponent, we talked a little bit after the game. He thought the same thing. He said uh, he thought I would play e5 there and I didn't think he had much. So even with this queen b3, queen b3 move, which is pretty interesting, put some annoying pressure on my uh, b pawn. Um, I didn't react right away. I just continued developing. I need to get the knight out of the way of the bishop, and the bishop is still defending the b-pawn, so it's not a problem just yet. But, uh, well, now he hops in with knight to e5, and uh, I am starting to feel like this position is a little bit awkward um, because uh, I just have trouble developing this bishop, and, um, you know, if I move my queen over here to defend the, uh, the c-pawn, he's always got maybe bishop to... Uh, f4 to take a look at the queen on that dark square and his knight is covering this light square. It just seems like uh, white has some pressure in this position. Um, so that's why uh, this c6 move maybe was not the best. It, it leads to a position where white, white has some pressure. Not that this is a bad position, but you might want to think um, this would be a good point to uh, uh, do the first little uh, quiz of this game. What would you play here? Now that I've talked about some of the problems in the position, what would you... What would you uh, uh, think about in this position and what would you what would you play as black so go ahead and pause the video and uh, take some time to think about it okay I'm going to give the answer away now um, the chess 
engine recommended move, which I think is quite a good one, is to play knight to b6. It kind of solves a bunch of problems. And we saw the chess engine wanted to play knight to b6 uh, even earlier. It was already uh, a couple moves back willing to move that knight away from, uh, from d5 and put it on b6. And now we see it does a useful job here. It shields that b-pawn from the queen. It also is cooperating with uh, the other knight in restraining his, um, his d-pawn from coming forward. Um, plus, the knight was never stable on that square anyway, because uh, white could always play e4 at some point and chase the knight away. And a third point of this move is that now not only can the bishop develop, but it can also develop with a tempo against the queen. And it seems like uh, e6 is probably a good square for the bishop. So for all of those reasons, uh, knight b6 is probably the best move in this position. Um, I didn't like that move. I, I think I thought about it briefly, and I was thinking, well, why am I, you know, retreating my pieces? But, you know, you've got to, uh, shouldn't be so uh, dogmatic. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the fact that it's uh, retreating or uh, that it's a backwards move should not be disqualifying if it's, if it's doing a lot of good things as well. And uh, well, we just pointed out some of the good things that it's doing. So, um, but I was still feeling the pressure on this um, B file. And so I was looking for a way to eliminate that pressure. And I came up with the idea of um, trading off this knight and then playing queen to uh, B6 to, uh, you know, just block his queen along this uh, file. And I had to, well, I wanted to trade the knight first because I wasn't sure if, uh, you know, he's got three pieces looking at the knight. So if I come in, if I just play queen to b6 immediately, I think maybe he can snap that off and uh, win a pawn there. Although I'm not, it's not clear. <laughs> I'm not, I didn't, I didn't uh, check that out. I mean, they, I also have ideas of trading queens there. So, um, but I decided to take first. He took back. And then I played queen to b6, and um, he played a really interesting move here. He played knight to c4. He didn't trade queens right away. He didn't move the uh, queen away. Um, he played knight to c4, kicking my queen, and uh, he asked me, well, what's my plan here? So this is um, an, a, second, a second point where it's, uh, <clears throat> it would be good to think about this position. See if you can find the best move for black in this position. Okay, uh, pause the video if you want some time to think about it. I'm going to give the answer away. Um, Let's see, should I start with the, the move I played? Yeah, the move I played was not best. And in fact, after this move, up until this point, I'm still okay. And I still have a, a reasonable moves here. After queen takes b3, that's what I played. I'm actually in some trouble. So uh, let's look at uh, the chess engine suggestion. Um, it doesn't want to trade queens. It just wants to play queen a6. And actually, queen a6 is a pretty strong move here. Um, it's hitting that uh, knight, and it's also taking a look at this undefended e-pawn. And there's a threat of bishop. The bishop is coming out here to uh, attack the knight. So if, for example, um, rook to e1 to free up the knight to move, you play, you play rook e1 here. This was, this was one line. Rook e1 here, then um, just bishop e6 wins material. That There's no way to save the knight at this point. So you can't do that. And um, actually, the, the chess engine line here is uh, knight to e5. The knight can e move. It could also go back to uh, e3. And then the queen can actually grab the e-pawn. So, you know, it's a little bit of a stretch to, um, to say that black is better because, uh, because obviously that queen will get kicked around and white will get a bunch of tempos. But, uh, but black will be a pawn up. The chess engine rates that as uh, about an even position. So queen a6 was the right answer. I, I don't know if any of you thought of that, but uh, if you did, give yourselves credit. Um, you know, other moves, just moving the queen away, are okay as well. But the trade is a definite mistake. And um, after, after the exchange here, um, it's my turn to move. And I just um, played a move here without um, doing the tactical survey. If you've... Uh, if you've uh, you know seen some of my other videos about, uh, I think it was chess mistakes of an A player. And one of the things I talked about is how you need to do a tactical survey before every move. So imagine you're black here 
and uh, and before you make your move, you want to do a tactical survey. You want to see what uh, tactics you have, and you also want to see what are your opponent's threats. What tactic does your opponent have? And see if you can spot the tactic that White has. Okay, uh, I'm going to give the answer away. The, the tactic that White has in this position is knight to b6. It's taking advantage of the, uh, of the pin on this file. So if we back up just a few moves, this is why queen takes b3 is such a bad move. It, uh, it opens up a file for his, uh, his rook and it immediately introduces this tactic. But even without the tactic, it's kind of a bad move on principle. I'm helping my opponent uh, develop. Uh, I'm trading off two developed pieces and I'm helping him develop his rook. So I, I lose in that exchange. Okay, so queen takes, pawn takes, and now there's this threat of knight to b6. So what should I do about it? Now, it turns out the move I played um, is uh, one of the better defenses. Um, it's, it's tough to find a good defense here. Um, you know, one line is bishop to e6. I didn't play this. Um, and then he can play uh, e4, you know, trying to harass this bishop here. I mean, I, I was just worried about how am I ever getting uh, this bishop developed when he has these pawns that can come uh, rushing forward pretty quickly. Uh, he also has knight to uh, a5 here going after the undefended b pawn. So, um, but that is one, one of the uh, better replies here. The move I played um, was knight d5. You know, I couldn't find a good square for my bishop. I thought there were problems with all of them, and so I ended up playing the knight here with the idea that, uh, well, he can't kick it right away because I'm threatening to uh, take on uh, take on c3, and then maybe this will give me a tempo to develop my uh, bishop. Um, but uh, he went for the, the tactic. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's see. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say is I, I forgot to do the tactical survey. So it was kind of a coincidence that this knight d5 move sort of halfway defends against this knight b6. But what he can do is he can take my knight, and he did. He took it. But, uh, well, this isn't losing yet because after knight b6 hitting my rook, I have bishop to uh, h3 uh, attacking his rook. And so I just sort of by the skin of my teeth, I am uh, holding on here. But uh, just to tell you about my mental state during the game, I recognized after I played... Um, knight to d5 here, and I was thinking about what's he going to uh, play. And that, that was when I recognized there was this threat, the threat of knight to b6, and I was kind of kicking myself already because, you know, I'm, I'm violating my own rules there. I'm not doing the tactical survey, because if, uh, if I had thought of that, um, I might have uh, been able to find another defense. Now, it turns out, uh, just by kind of coincidence, that knight d5 is, is the uh, one of the best defenses available, but... Uh, but you can't rely on that kind of luck all the time. And it's also because this bishop h3 resource that I didn't see until uh, you know, I was kind of examining this, trying to figure out what would happen. Uh, notice that um, he can't just kick the, uh, the knight away with e4. This turns out to be a pretty bad line for white. I'll take on c3. Cancel that. Take on c3. And now he can hop in here hitting my rook. But, uh, well, I have this check. So the king moves. And then, uh, then I can take here. And this, uh, this hits his uh, knight and it hits his rook. And so there's, there's nothing better than to go for this exchange. And I come out, okay, actually black is better in that line. So trying to, trying to chase that knight away with e4 doesn't work. But uh, just taking, which is what he played, is, uh, leaves white with, a, with some kind of advantage in all these lines. So I took, he went knight b6. I found this bishop h3 resource even while I was thinking about things. So I had this in my back pocket. And um, and so we just go down this line. He takes the knight. I take the rook. He takes he takes my rook with his knight. I take his rook with my bishop. And now he, um, he defends his knight. I didn't see this one, but this is a good move. He defends his knight instead of retreating it. And this also puts a little bit of pressure on the b-pawn, although he can't take it immediately because um, because his knight is uh, is also under attack. But uh, I can take the e-pawn. So we come out of this and the material is even, but um, 
he plays knight to b6 here, and he's going after my b pawn. So uh, here's one more chance for you. Um, so as I said, uh, black is worse in this position, but what you want to do when you're in a worse position is try and make the best of it. So what is the, the best move to hang on? And I think at best black has uh, drawing chances here, but there's a pretty big difference between the, the best move here and the second best move. So if you want to uh, pause the video here and see if you can find uh, the best move for black. Okay, uh, I'm going to give the answer away now. Um, the chess engine likes the move bishop to f3 here. Holding on to this pawn. This pawn was hanging, uh, by the way. The knight was attacking that pawn. The rook's attacking this pawn. So it's kind of a question of which pawn do you want to save. And um, so uh, white takes the b pawn. And then you have this move e5. And that's why um, this is the best line. Um, you're going to undermine these pawns over here with this e5 move. Let's see, um, white can defend with bishop to e3, take, and uh, pawn takes is given as the as the move here. Although I, I would think uh, bishop takes is possible. Let's see, after bishop takes, maybe the trade is not particularly good for, uh, yeah, I would still, uh, if he took with the bishop, I would trade and I would still get a situation where he has these uh, isolated pawns. So um, so let's pause here. Well, let's one more move. Rook e8, I guess, is the, the follow-up. Um, <clears throat> so in this position, white has the extra pawn and it's an outside pass pawn. Um, but I have the bishop pair versus a, uh, a rook and a knight and that pawn is still a ways away from uh, queening. So anyway, the chess engine rates this as uh, only about half a pawn better for white, which means I have uh, pretty good um, drawing chances in this position. So that would be the best way to play this. Um, if we back up, let's go back to the position where I had to make the decision right here. You know, I felt like I had the choice between saving this pawn and this pawn, and I thought it would be better for me to have this outside pawn um, to preserve and prevent uh, him from getting his outside pass pawn. So his passer would be one of these two interior pawns. And, you know, it's easier for me to get my pieces over to stop them. The king is closer and things like that. So just on those kind of general considerations, I thought that um, that bishop a6, defending the b pawn would be the better move. And also I had some ideas. Maybe I can get pressure against this trapped rook, although it turns out to be really hard. I mean, this bishop is, uh, is many moves away. I can't uh, come out here to this diagonal, for example, because he's got that all controlled with his pawns. Um, and uh, let's see, moving the rook out of the way, pushing the pawn forward and snaking the bishop around, uh, like I said, to harass the rook is is a long, long journey and, and things uh, go wrong before then. Um, and that is just the problem with this move. Um, so first he's going to take, but um, you know immediately he's got ideas of uh, well, he's, he's hitting this pawn. He's also maybe threatening to come to c7 and, and uh, just take off my bishop and, and win another pawn over there. So, um, so if we back up to the point where I had to make the decision between saving these two pawns, um, the, uh, it, it's better to save this pawn, not because of any general uh, region, reason, but because um, just for um, you have to look at the specific moves after after you save the pawn. I come here and save this pawn. Um, he immediately gets play against my bishop there. My bishop is kind of stuck there and he can attack it. And uh, his his attack is much quicker than mine. So just for, um, you know, simple tactical reasons, which, you know, if I had just uh, looked ahead a few moves, I might have been able to figure it out that uh, saving this pawn is much worse than trying to save the uh, save the center pawn. Okay, but that's how the game went. I went here and now he's clearly winning. So he takes, and um, I can't uh, I can't defend this because uh, he's got knight to c7 hitting my rook and hitting the bishop, so that would be pretty annoying. So I kick the knight. He goes knight c7, and I went rook to c8. Now let's see, that was another point that uh, I also couldn't play rook to c8 right away, trying to put pressure on the c-pawn because the knight here is a... Uh, fork and hits the king and the rook. So, you know, my moves here were limited. So anyway, 
That's why I settled on this uh, e6 move. Um, he goes knight c7. Now I play rook to c8, hitting the uh, hitting the knight and hoping to capture the uh, the c pawn here in in exchange for the a pawn and, and split up his pawns. So he just goes ahead and uh, takes the bishop off here. And uh, well, here I, I spotted a tactic and I thought, oh well, this is kind of interesting. Maybe this will uh, give me some chances. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know. If you want to, you can try and guess what, what tactic I spotted here or thought I spotted. Okay, I'm going to play the move. I played uh, bishop takes d4. Now, this move loses, but but basically I was already lost. Everything loses. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I had some ideas here, right? If he uh, takes the bishop, <clears throat> then I can take here with check and then grab the knight. And uh, actually, he's still a little better. He's still a pawn up then because he'll grab the pawn. But I thought it would give me some chances. But, uh, of course, he doesn't have to take the bishop. And, um, you know, I, th I thought it was kind of forcing because I'm attacking his rook. His knight is hanging. And um, and there's this pin along this file. But he just simply plays the move. Rook takes b7, solving all those problems. Gets his rook out of trouble. Gets his knight out of trouble. Um, let's see, I went ahead and took on c3. He played bishop to h6, uh, threatening threatening mate, so I would have to retreat uh, my rook, and I just resigned at this point because, uh, well, I'm just a piece down. He's got the same number of pawns as I do, and uh, he's got an extra piece, and uh, and I, had, I don't have any activity or any other compensation because uh, I have to bring my pieces back to defense. So I went ahead and resigned. So anyway, that was my first round game. Um, it has the advantage uh, of being a short game, so that at least I was able to rest up for the next game. Um, you know, a first game in a tournament like this is also a chance to kind of um, uh, calibrate how you're doing. And actually, I felt like I wasn't doing too badly. I made uh, some typical kind of mistakes that I make, um, but there are also uh, uh, points in the game where I was able to calculate quite clearly and uh, figure things out correctly. I think um, the biggest takeaway I took away from this game is I had to remember to do my tactical survey before each move. And uh, and that would have uh, helped me out, helped me spot that knight b6 idea uh, a move or two sooner. Um, and uh, so that was, uh, and in the, uh, you know, I hadn't looked at it with the chess engine. That was just my own evaluation after the game. I think in retrospect, now that I've had uh, more time to think about it, um, that uh, really trading queens was, was a big mistake, um, both in terms of the specific tactics, but also in general terms, because I'm helping him develop his piece. Um, but I, I hadn't really uh, thought about that at the time. I was just uh, in the immediate aftermath of the game. You know, it's, it's good to have a positive mental state. So I was, I was still feeling pretty good about my game playing ability, and I had a break before round two. So anyway, I'll be back soon with uh, round two coverage. See you then.